Right. Um, we're going to get rolling just because we've got a lot of ground to cover and people will keep trickling in. Um, I'm Marty Downs. I direct the LTER Network Office, and I want to welcome everyone to the first of our monthly LTER community calls. Uh, these calls are, the, the network includes nearly 2,000 participants, um, including investigators, postdoctoral associates, students, educators, and staff, technicians. Um, so these monthly calls are an opportunity for that broad swath of the network to learn from and about your colleagues that are doing amazing work. Uh, we'll talk about a variety of topics in these calls. The uh, This first one was a sort of convenient time to hold the the orientation, but we expect to talk about emerging science initiatives, spin-off projects, related organizations, or deep dives into LTR science, education, data, and engagement. Um, we want to hear what you want to hear about, so I welcome you to submit topic ideas either directly to me or Gabe or to uh, use the form that's on the community calls page. So that's lternet.edu slash community hyphen calls. Um, today, you're going to be hearing from myself and Greg Maurer and Gabe De La Rosa. And um, we'll just jump right in. The LTER Code of Conduct applies to today's call as well as all other LTER calls. Um, it's available at lternet.edu slash code of conduct with hyphens. And um, essentially, it translates to be uh, respectful and attentive. Uh, feel free to disagree with ideas, but don't attack anyone personally. And um, yeah, we appreciate everyone's point of view. On this call, uh, meet, mute, please mute unless you're actually speaking. Uh, you're welcome to pipe in and speak with questions, but uh, there's enough people on the call that it gets noisy if we have folks unmuted. We'll pause for questions at several points. You can either raise your hand or put your questions in the chat. Um, and by way of introduction, uh, we welcome folks to just put your home LTER site into the chat and one thing you'd like to learn about the LTER network. I'd also welcome folks to um, change their um, uh, Hollywood square to reflect the site that they're associated with uh, and pronouns if they like. Uh, I personally identify as she, her. Um, we're going to cover a lot of ground, as I said today, a quick overview of the network. Um, a review of LTR data and where we put it and why it's important. Um, a, a flyover of the 27 LTR sites and their science. And a bit of time on finding people and information in the network and save some time for questions. So diving right in. Uh, LTR network is uh, over 40 years old now. We've accumulated sites over those 40 years. We now uh, number 27 sites, including a really wide variety of ecosystems. And we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, each site is funded on a six-year funding cycle, so uh, they are renewed and evaluated against their performance and the novelty and uh, sustainability of their science. It includes thousands of investigators from universities, uh, NGOs, agent, federal, state, local management agencies. Uh, we now number over 7,000 data sets uh, available in the Environmental Data Initiative repository, which you'll hear about a little bit later, as well as many others, uh, and over 17,000 journal articles and nearly uh, 26,000 if you include uh, reports and dissertation and theses. Um, the network originally funded in 1980 to address um, 
questions that required long-term research. Uh, and five core areas were identified at that time, uh, primary production, populations and communities, organic matter, inorganic nutrients and disturbance, to guide data collection and inquiry uh, into broad areas that make the science in the LTR network um, synthesizable, shall we say, uh, able to compare across many sites uh, in those areas. Uh, uh, a little bit later, in oops, a little bit later, we added two additional areas with the addition of the um, urban ecosystem LTERs, at that time Baltimore and Central Arizona Phoenix, uh, focusing on disturbance and social ecological systems, land use, land cover change. Um, so I, as you might expect, LTER science uh, addresses long-term observation in many, many areas. There are data sets at many LTERs, you'll hear a little bit more about later, uh, that run for, in some cases, 100 years. Um, but 10, 20 years is not at all uncommon. Uh, and that's rare in ecology. Uh, we also host long-term experiments, and that is even rarer. Uh, so we have ecosystem scale manipulations as well as narrower plot level manipulations that have been maintained for decades at many sites. Uh, and uh, interestingly, what we're often moving into now is watching the recovery from those manipulations. Um, pretty exciting science and a real opportunity to plug into. Um, the experimentation and the long-term observations provide amazing fodder for modeling and LTER is involved in modeling ecosystem processes at many levels, both uh, individual site levels and, uh, and all the way up to global models. Uh, the location, long-term location at any individual site also provides tremendous opportunities for engaging with community. So uh, we've got a couple of new projects uh, and some very, very long-term projects. Many sites are uh, have partnered from the beginning with uh, state agencies, local management agencies, NGOs in their area. Um, and those are tremendous opportunities that uh, students and investigators alike should seek out and plug into. Uh, similarly, education, being at one site in one community for a long time provides tremendous opportunities to engage with local educators and every site has some education relationships. Uh, and we are beginning to uh, to host a number of cross-site research experience for teachers projects and, uh, and student education projects. Um, I mentioned the core areas are ripe for synthesis. And, uh, and so we do a ton of that, both funded through the LTR network office and uh, funded through a number of other sources. Later this spring, you should keep an eye out for uh, the LTR network. We'll have a, a, a request for proposals for synthesis projects that um, are funded and supported in uh, analytical support and logistical support and travel support by the network office. Um, so, Data is the core of our science, and I'm going to turn you over now to Greg Marr, who's both an LTER information manager and a um, uh, uh, staff member of the Environmental Data Initiative Repository. Thanks, Marty. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, yep, I'm here to talk about data management in the LTR network and how you can participate in our data environment. Um, can we go to the next slide? So, um, as Marty mentioned, the LTR network has been around for quite a while now, and uh, data and data management have been a priority in the network since the beginning, really. Uh, so the long-term ecological data that we collect really underpins the science, and the network has been 
uh, an innovator and a leader in data management and the open science sort of movement since uh, pretty much since the beginning. So, so there are a lot of reasons why you should care about data uh, as a LTR researcher and about publishing your research data. Um, so, so yeah, we try to encourage a commitment to transparency and reproducibility in the science and the network. Um, publishing data and using published data can make research money go farther. It is also something that is required by our funders and by the journals that you want to publish to. Um, and then there are just a lot of reasons that are kind of good for your career and good for science. So you do get um, citations for the data you publish, and it's really a good way to kind of start up collaborations. Uh, next slide, please. So, and the other reason that publishing your data and sort of participating in the data management that happens in the network, uh, another good reason to do that is that you really are participating in this kind of wider um, ecosystem of data that's uh, that's really important now. So in the last few decades, uh, ecology and the environmental sciences have really sort of expanded. There are a lot of new data collecting networks out there that LTR interacts with. And a lot of the research we do now as ecologists or environmental scientists really draws on data from all of those different networks. So, so getting your data out there lets you participate. And so in the LTR network, we try to prioritize making our data kind of interoperable and open to some of those other networks and getting you involved in things like ecological synthesis. So the network takes data management seriously. Every LTER site has an information manager. So there are 29 of us. You can see us there on the right. Um, data managers, uh, one of our main responsibilities is to help publish research data uh, out into the community. We also do other things like managing lists of publications and personnel and websites and other information. Um, as we do that, we try to follow community standards. Um, and then, so that would be things like, you know, this kind of greater ecological community or environmental science community that we're a part of. We also try to follow the LTR data policy, which has some requirements for publishing data that are, you know, kind of there as, as part of our, our funding situation. So get to know your data manager. We're all really nice people and we're here to help get your data out there, make sure it's high quality and make sure that, that uh, yeah, it's a good contribution to the LTR network and beyond. Next slide. So when I talk about publishing data sets, this is essentially what we're talking about. So on the right, you see a data set published in the Environmental Data Initiative Repository uh, or EDI. That's, um, I think it's probably where most uh, LTR data go, but there are, there are other NSF approved repositories that LTR uses as well. Um, so when you publish a data set, that data set should get a DOI, which is a unique um, resolvable internet address basically for your data set. Uh, you can see, you should be able to see data files that are downloadable from that data set and uh, rich metadata that describe the data, which we'll talk about in a minute. But So these published data sets are important research outputs for the network. So, so we encourage the view that you know, that these are something to prioritize. They're not just sort of an afterthought for publishing your paper or something like that. We really do wanna make high quality data a, a product of the, the network. Uh, next slide, please. So to get those data sets published, this is the basic process. Um, you, the researcher, go you go out and collect and analyze and interpret ecological data. We really try to encourage you to collect lots of metadata that describes your data while you do that. And then information managers are kind of a, a facil facilitator or like an intermediary to publishing the data. So we review the data sets that you collect. We put the metadata that you collect into a structured format called uh, the Ecological Metadata Language or EML. And then we publish them to these open access repositories. Um, so EDI, plus others. And then we also try to make sure that those data sets are available on LTR websites. Next slide, please. 
So metadata is important in this process. Um, so when you collect your data and publish your paper, that's when you know the most about your data. Um, and as soon as you sort of set that aside, you know, the publication comes out or whatever, the usable information content that you remember declines over time. And if you have an attached metadata, so that's information about who collected the data, what are the data, when they were collected, how they were collected, and those types of things. If you don't attach that to the data, then you can really lose the context and understanding of the data over time. So that's why we emphasize metadata collection. And you should really think about whether somebody can use your data far down the road without needing to ask you questions about it. Because at some point, you won't be able to answer questions about your data anymore. Next slide, please. So uh, what should you publish? This is, you know, this is a question that uh, students and researchers ask a lot is, what do I actually need to publish? Uh, the short answer is just data and metadata. You should plan for this early in your research project and just make sure you talk to your information manager. And they're really a great person to help guide you to how to publish a data set and what to include in it. Next slide. Uh, the Environmental Data Initiative is that data repository that LTR works very closely with. So we are a uh, research data repository and we really focus on high quality metadata uh, and the standards for those and on using data in the repository. So, so we want people to think of data in the repository as something to actually do research with. And it's not, you know, it's not just a long-term archive that, you know, where data goes to be forgotten about. Uh, LTER is our biggest data contributor and our closest partner. And those are some of the EDI folks that you'll work with uh, as you do your LTR research and publish your data. Um, so we really prioritize getting LTR network data into the EDI repository. We work very closely with LTR data managers. Um, we do software development that helps you put data into, um, into EDI. So on the right is one of our kind of more recent releases. This is the Easy EML. Uh, web application. And so it's basically a form for entering data and metadata to create a publishable, publishable data set in EDI. Um, so you should ask your information manager if using easy EML is right for you and, and it might be a good way to create those publishable data sets. Um, and other things EDI does is we really try to create a lot of documentation and best practices for how to publish data um, what good quality metadata is and things like that. So we try to be a resource as you create your data. And then once you do publish your data, we provide some quality assessments and we also try to track citations and other kind of impact metrics for your data. Next slide, please. We also wanna help you reuse published data. Uh, EDI's got over 9,000 unique public data sets and they all have high quality metadata. Um, most of those are LTR data sets, as, as Marty mentioned. Um, so we provide tools for data discovery and exploration to help you find and kind of explore the data that you might want to use in your research. So on the right, you see um, our DEX program. So any, uh, any tabular data that you see in EDI, you should be able to kind of explore with this DEX uh, interface. We have a few projects that harmonize data after it gets published and turn it into analysis ready data products. So that Ecocom DP project uh, and paper that you see at the bottom and uh, is a project to harmonize ecological community and biodiversity data. And then we have a similar effort called HiMet DP, which is starting to do the same thing for hydrology and meteorology data. Um, a lot of these things are kind of developed with EDI and LTR working groups. And, and you will also find EDI at meetings and other events, kind of offering workshops and training in some of these data publication and data harmonization uh, activities. So, so look for us at ESA and other places like that. And I think that's about all. Yeah, so thanks for participating in network 
uh, data activities, contact your IM. And if you need EDI support, there's our email address. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, mm -hmm. I will also point out that many of the um, leaders of the Environmental Data Initiative uh, got their start as LTER information managers. So they are super familiar with the context in which you collect and use your data. Um, it's also a great time to pause and introduce uh, Gabe De La Rosa, who's our uh, communications coordinator for the LTER network office. You'll interact with Gabe around uh, newsletter, email, committee meetings, uh, basically everything. Um, Nick Lyon, who is, uh, give a wave Nick, uh, Nick's a data analyst in the LTR network office. He supports synthesis working groups and uh, interacts frequently with the LTR information managers. Um, and uh, an R whiz and a, a great storyteller if you get a chance to uh, spend some time with him. Molly Phillips is our brand new inclusion and access coordinator, and we are really excited to have Molly on board. The LTR network has been, I, I did a calculation recently. Uh, we think about 15% of the, um, of all the environmental graduate students in the country do LTER research. Um, I at some point in their careers, they are connected with LTERs. And so we recognize that LTER is a potentially a huge lever for increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the environmental science community. And uh, we're not covering a huge amount of this today, but you will hear a lot more about it in future uh, community calls. Um, so I'm going to dive in and just do a sort of whirlwind tour of LTER sites. And uh, the they there are so many contexts and there is so much background and uh, the science is incredibly exciting. So I am only gonna give this the barest of brushes, uh, but you can find uh, a great deal more detail at the sites. All the sites have their um, I, I think every one of the proposals that they've submitted over the life of the site is available on their sites. It's also available through the network office. You can dive in and learn a ton about each of them. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a tiny taste and let you uh, explore from there. Kansa Prairie is located in the Flint Hills of Kansas. It was one of the first six LTER sites that was funded. Uh, and they focus on fire, grazing, and climactic variability uh, and their interactions. They have a ton of uh, experimental treatments, including grazing intensity, experimental burns, and sequential restoration. Um, so we're, the, the order here is, uh, we're gonna go kind of by general biome. Uh, Kellogg Biological Station is located in Hickory Corners, Michigan, the only row crop agriculture site in the network. Uh, and they have particular interests in how microbial communities evolve under different cropping systems. Uh, they also are co-located with the long-term agro eco research site, uh, which makes a, a tremendous combination. Moving on to mixed ecosystems, the uh, Hornada Basin LTER, located in the Chihuahua de Chihuahuan Desert, and co-located with the USDA Hornada Experimental Range, um, which gives them a 100-plus year timeline for many of their long-term data sets. Uh, their research looks primarily at state transitions, connectivity, and uh, precipitation variability, and signature experiments there include precipitation exclusion and dust transport. Cedar Creek LTR is located at the intersection of uh, four major biomes, um, established in 1940, located in central Minnesota with a focus on human-driven environmental change. Uh, when you see uh, 
probably half of the photos that represent experiments at LTER sites uh, are related to uh, Cedar Creek LTER. They have a long, long history of particularly biodiversity and productivity, um, as well as many other experimental drivers. Um, Sevieta LTER is located on the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the focuses, research focuses on biological processes in drylands, uh, especially rainfall, rainfall variants, nutrients, and biocrusts. Uh, Bonanza Creek LTER is located in Alaska uh, in the floodplain and upland forests of the Tanana River tributary of the Yukon. Um, and they're really interested in how the boreal biome responds to climate change and the local, regional, and global impacts of that. Uh, much of their work focuses on succession after fire and changing permafrost regimes. Uh, moving on to forests, the Andrews Forest LTER is located at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest. So uh, the next five sites actually are um, partner with USDA experimental forests located in national forests. Uh, so Andrews is in the Willamette National Forest. And uh, research foci there include stream ecology, forests as climate refugia, uh, long-term decay of uh, coarse woody debris. And when they say coarse, they mean enormous tree trunks. Um, they have a strong emphasis also on the intersection of arts, humanities, and sciences. The LTER Ecological Reflections Project was born at Andrews Forest and continues uh, to have great support there. Harvard Forest, uh, located at Harvard University's 4,000 acre laboratory and classroom, uh, which uh, the Harvard Forest itself was established in 1907. So similarly, many of their data sets run much longer than uh, the 40 years of the network. Um, they have a long history of work on soil carbon and nitrogen dynamics, biodiversity, historical ecology, and conservation and management. More recently, a ton of work on scenarios. John Jonathan Thompson's work there is really exciting. Um, their signature experiments include a hurricane simulation, uh, soil warming. Uh, it's pictured all those little brown squares are, are warmed uh, plots of soil, uh, hemlock removal, and forest litter addition and removal experiments. Um, the Hubbard Brook LTER is based at um, the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which was established in 1955. Uh, long history there of research on disturbance, including uh, acid rain, as many as of you will know, and more recently, nitrogen oligification um, and early warning signals of state change. Uh, Lukio LTER is the only tropical forest site in the network um, based at Lukio Experimental Forest and uh, El Yunque National Forest. And they focus on intense disturbances. Uh, you might have noticed they've gotten a lot of hurricanes lately, but knowing what a system looks like before the hurricane hits is really key to um, being able to understand the impacts. Some of their long-term experiments there include a canopy trimming experiment through fall exclusion and streamflow reduction. They've been looking at drought recently. Uh, the Arctic LTER, located in the foothills of Alaska's Brooks Range and based out of University of Alaska's Tulik Field Station. Um, research there is organized around terrestrial ecosystems, lakes, streams, and, uh, and connectivity across those three ecosystem types. Um, they have long, long record of whole ecosystem manipulations, including nitrogen and phosphorus fertilization, warming, and uh, consumer removal, both in terrestrial and um, aquatic systems. And the multiple element limitation model came out of research at Tulik and other LTER sites. Um, you might have noticed we've moved on from forests. We're now looking at uh, tundra and uh, mountain and tundra sites. Uh, so Nahuat Ridge is located in the Southern Rocky Mountains. Research there began in the 40s and includes a wide range of work on high elevation systems, 
uh, including animal ecology. They love their pikas and uh, hydrology and geomorphology. Uh, new work includes a major new sensor network, a uh, simulation of early snowmelt by adding black sand to the snow surface, and a whole variety of other experiments. Um, urban LTRs were added to the network in the late 90s with the introduction of the Central Arizona Phoenix and the um, Baltimore LTER site. Baltimore has uh, moved on to other funding sources at this point, and we've recently added the Minneapolis St. Paul site. Uh, CAP is really a, um, a touchstone for urban ecology. CAP and BES together essentially um, cemented the field. Um, their focus is mostly on urban ecological infrastructure, and they use a social ecological technological, technological science framework, um, so including engineering as well as social and natural scientists. Um, some signature data sets and experiments include a long-running urban bird survey, a desert fertilization experiment, ton of water quality research, and uh, they work very frequently with the Phoenix Area Social Survey. Uh, Gabe actually wrote a cool story about that uh, a couple of years ago on the uh, network website. Minneapolis St. Paul is much more recently established, 2021, and partners with the Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, and a whole slew of local and academic partners. Um, study the effect of urban stressors on ecological structure and functioning, including especially urban forests, pollinators, and waterways. Um, we have just a couple of sites that are uh, entirely fresh or largely fr freshwater focused. Uh, there are There is aquatic work at many, many other sites. So the the North Temperate Lakes LTER is, um, the science there is rooted in the long-term research of Burge and Jude in the 1920s and 30s and in the experiments of Arthur Hassler uh, in the 60s. Became an LTER site in the first round of, fun of NSF funding. And their current focus is on abrupt ecological change, variability, uh, especially lake phenology, water quality, uh, invasive species, and the removal of invasive species and other interacting drivers. Uh, the McMurdo Dry Valleys, uh, a little ironically, is the other largely aquatic site. Um, it's founded in 1992, or the, uh, shall we say, the, the other freshwater site, uh, located on the west coast of McMurdo Sound in Antarctica, and in it's a, an incredibly severe environment. So McMurdo kind of offers the end member of uh, climate and um, biology for the LTR network. Um, LTR MCM6, so the sixth round of funding for McMurdo Dry Valley's LTR focuses on ecological legacies and connectivity. As you can imagine, when things thaw in the dry valleys is, is the opportunity for things to move across the landscape. Um, there were a slew of coastal sites funded in, funded in the LTR network in the early 2000s. So we have uh, five or six coastal sites coming up. Santa Barbara Coastal is the only, well, Santa Barbara on the coast of California and the Beaufort Lagoon, I guess, maybe qualifies as a West Coast site. Um, <clears throat> Santa Barbara Coastal was established in 2000, and their research focuses on how natural and human drivers influence giant kelp dynamics, uh, particularly looking at uh, exchange of genetic information, long-term structure and function of kelp forests, uh, transfer of material between the, um, the ocean and the land. The Plum Island Ecosystem LTER is located in the uh, watersheds of metropolitan Boston area. It's four neighboring watersheds that they focus on. 
um, launched in 1998 as a land margin ecosystem program and funded uh, in LTER, sorry, funded in LTER in 98, launched as the land margin ecosystem program in the earlier 1990s. Current research addresses uh, accelerated sea level rise, sediment starvation, and species migration. And long-term experiments there include total tidal marsh and creek fertilizations, mm, a detritus removal experiment, and a space for time substitution. Um, <clears throat> the Virginia Coastal Reserve is located on the Virginia's eastern shore. It's the first coastal site in the network established in 1988 and partners closely with the Nature Conservancy as many other, as well as other academic institutions. Um, they focus on the processes and feedbacks that drive state change, uh, including geomorphology, sea level rise, marsh, er marsh erosion, and restoration. Uh, Georgia, Co Georgia Coastal Ecosystem was established in 2000. Uh, they do a ton of remote sensing modeling work, so scaling up from plots to uh, to regional and larger scales. They're interested in characterizing perturbation patterns and relationships to external drivers. Um, Long-term manipulations there include saltwater intrusion, predator exclusion, and disturbance studies. Um, I want to note that these slides are going to be available on the network website, so you can go back and, and uh, dig into some of the details here also. Uh, Florida Coastal Everglades was established in 2000. It's located in freshwater wetlands, mangrove swamps, and shallow seagrass communities of the Florida Coastal Everglades. Um, they engage uh, very heavily with local and state water management agencies. Uh, they're located uh, largely within the, maybe entirely, uh, within the footprint of the Everglades National Park. Um, and they work a ton on water management and its impact on the ecosystem structure and nutrient fluxes, and particularly ecosystem services to people. Um, Beaufort Lagoon LTER is the northernmost site in the network, established in 2017. Uh, they're especially interested in land-sea interactions, seasonal dynamics, and long-term change. Um, they have an amazing engagement program with Inupiat school kids that's been going on uh, since the 70s. Their uh, principal investigator, Ken Dunton, established that very early on and continues as part of the, the LTER activities and also with uh, local elders who are uh, facing a vast eroding shoreline among many other climate change challenges. The uh, Palmer LTER is uh, located in, in Antarctica, uh, moving on to marine sites, established in 1990 uh, and focuses on the links between sea ice extent and timing and the trophic dynamics of plankton, krill, seabirds, and uh, <clears throat> larger organisms. California Current Ecosystem is um, a coastal upwelling site off the coast of Southern and uh, Central California. And they focus on nonlinear transitions in the pelagic ecosystem, builds on the data collected by the Cal Coffee Initiative. It's a cooperative initiative of many uh, state and local agencies. Mm. Northeast Shelf LTR is one of our newest. It's established in 2017. Uh, focuses, uh, as the name says, on the coastal shelf off of Massachusetts and uh, integrates a number of pre existing data streams into a really uh, coherent examination of uh, how planktonic food, web food webs are changing and how that impacts the productivity of higher trophic levels. In the Northern Gulf of Alaska, we have the North, Northern Gulf of Alaska LTER, um, focused on regulation of the spring algal bloom, role of freshwater inputs and drivers of high summer productivity. <clears throat> um, I, it also builds on uh, pre-existing 
observations of the sword line and the Gulf of Alaska mooring site. Uh, and last and far from least, the Morea Coral Reef site, which was established in 2004 on the island of Morea in French Polynesia, which looks at uh, community structure, disturbance, and resilience in coral reef ecosystems, especially focusing on uh, pulse and press disturbances. Uh, pulse disturbances such as uh, marine heat waves and um, uh, inv invasions of coral eating sea stars. Um, there's also a recent story on the network website looking at some of those intense disturbances. All right. Um, I really hope you folks dig into um, the details of many of those sites, but at least you have a taste of what's happening all across the network. I'm going to take a, a minute to talk about the kind of structure of the network and the LTER network office. Um, we LTR is really a bottom-up network. Every site is funded individually uh, and submits a proposal to the National Science, Science Foundation. They determine their science and we coordinate across the sites. So the LTR network office, which includes uh, me and Gabe and Nick and Molly and uh, a few other folks who couldn't be here today, uh, Ben Halpern's the executive director and uh, he He's involved with the working group today and couldn't make it, but um, we partner with the network, both the, the sort of large 2000 person diffuse community of the network and also the lead PIs who make up the LT, the science council of the LTR network uh, and their sort of working executive board, which is composed of about a third of the PIs at any given time, as well as the uh, standing committees of the network, which include the information managers, the DEI committee, education and outreach committee, and the graduate student committee. Those standing committees have uh, a designated representative from every site, but uh, they also welcome a participation by other individuals who are just interested in those topics. Um, so we work very closely across those boundaries. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over now to Gabe, who's gonna tell you a little bit about how you can uh, connect with the network and find out what's happening. Thanks, Marty. So yeah, after that overview of all the sites and all the people, you might be wondering, how the heck do I stay on top of all this stuff? Uh, and the good news is I get paid to do that. So, <laughs> to, and uh, I make it easy on you. Um, so there's a couple different things you might want to do. Um, you might want to stay up to date with uh, stuff going on in the network. You might want to connect with others, or you just might want to learn about what's going on at sites. Um, the best way to stay up to date um, is really via our newsletter. This is once monthly. I'll cover a bunch of what, what, what's actually contained in that newsletter on the next slide. Um, but if you're looking for one takeaway for how to stay engaged with this network, the newsletter is a good one. Um, we also just recently launched our community platform, which I'll also cover on in a couple of slides, but that's really meant to, to share information from all corners of the network to one, uh, one location and in, in sort of a timely manner. Um, and of course, we're on basically every social media um, that there is. Uh, that landscape's pretty weird right now, so our strategy is just to be everywhere. Um, so pick your favorite blue icon and give us a follow. And just as a reminder, uh, this um, this uh, this presentation will be online, and all these links are actually links to our uh, to our pages. So you can just go and click and follow wherever you may be. Um, so what if you want to connect with others? So we really put a lot of effort into trying to make sort of this very disparate and spread out network, uh, you know, sort of talk to itself, um, talk to each other. Um, we launched our community platform, which again, I'll cover uh, on another slide, um, to as a way to sort of let researchers communicate from different parts of the site, uh, different parts of the, the, the network, 
um, around common topics or events or whatnot. Um, we also launched these community calls of which you're now joining. Um, but these these are a good way. These these are sort of a forum, a car dedicated space um, every month uh, for people around the network to convene on a topic. Um, so presentations like this and orientation uh, orientation to the network. But we also envision you know a presentation of graduate student research. You know uh, a conversation about different research topics. Um, maybe covering some DEI strategies around the network. This is really a forum for people to talk, to get together and talk about, um, you know, whatever they want to talk about. Um, and so these will happen monthly um, into the foreseeable future. Um, so stay tuned for more information on those. Um, if you just want to learn about what's going on in the network, uh, Marty did a good job of shilling two of my stories already. Um, but we publish we publish a lot of stories, mainly about science um, around the network, but also about all sorts of other things, you know, education initiatives, events, stuff like that. Um, those website stories you can just find on our homepage at ltrnet.edu. Um, a subset of those stories are part of our Salter blog. So this is the short stories about long-term research uh, blog. Uh, this is a graduate dr student driven blog um, that's meant to be sort of a, a less formal way to get the word out about what's going on at sites. So graduate students uh, sort of just write, you know, five or 800 words, about a page, page and a half um, about their research, about their experience. Um, these are great. You know, we publish a lot of stories about science, which is, you know, published in a journal. It's very the narrative is very clear. Uh, but the Salter blog tends to be more about, you know, what's actually, what is it actually like to be out in the field in old growth forest or out at sea for a week? Um, and they're a great way to get sort of a window into, into life at the LTER. Um, our Instagram is also run by graduate students. Um, so feel free to give us a follow. We highlight, you know, work around all the sites. Um, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's just a really low stakes way to get a, a snippet of information from from a wide variety of stuff going on around the network. And then we also have a YouTube channel, which hosts uh, everything from you know, recorded webinars like this uh, to five minute lightning talks from each of the sites um, that occur at our science council meeting to, to much, much more. So go, go check that out. Um, next story, Marty. So our newsletter. Um, our newsletter is, uh, is really the, the, the catch all for uh, you know, things going on around the network. Um, so what's actually contained in this newsletter? Um, we have research stories, as I mentioned, these all make it, uh, the links to, to, to all the recent uh, stories end up in our newsletter. So this, this includes both, um, both those science stories that I and a, a couple of graduate writing fellows write, but also Salter blog stories. Um, we have a big section of upcoming activities. Um, so, you know, save the dates for, uh, for our events and other partners' events, you know. Uh, announcements for meetings, announcements for webinars like this one, and occasionally collaboration opportunities. So um, Marty said that there's a lot of cross-network cross synthesis that goes on. Well, we just recently had um, a call for collaborators for, from one of those synthesis groups. Um, so it's a great way to sort of tap into, you know, some of the ongoing work in the, in the network. We also post a DEI resource of the month. So we have a diversity, equity, inclu inclusion, and justice committee um, that gets together once a month, and uh, they come up with a resource that makes it makes it in, in into this newsletter. Um, so this is a great way to sort of stay on, um, stay up to date with what's uh, what's happening in that space. There's been a lot of conversation about, um, you know, equity and belonging in the field, um, accessibility stuff like that, and so we we try to highlight those resources. Um, and then, of course, we have a ton of jobs and funding opportunities, right? There's 27 different sites. There's always a need from, you know, looking for graduate, new graduate students to lab techs to faculty. Um, you know, we highlight all those jobs um, around the network. Um, and then funding opportunities as well. We sort of collect the relevant uh, funding opportunities uh, across ecology and try to highlight them. Um, so, you know, there's something in this newsletter for everybody. Um, it comes out once a month at the end of the month. Um, and yeah, you should definitely give it a follow. Um, and then, yeah, so we we launched our community forum earlier this year and, and we're really excited about this. Um, we we really see it as a way for, for folks in the network to connect with peers across the network. Um, the huge advantage of a community forum like this, as opposed to our newsletter, is our newsletter comes out once a month, which, you know, if it comes out one day before your event, that's not very much time to, to, to 
to promote your webinar or your job or your funding or whatnot. Um, so we really see this as a way to, to also let people share, you know, those job postings as they come out, uh, funding opportunities, events around the network. Um, it's a good way to, to learn what happens at other sites as well. So, uh, you know, all the, all the stories end up on here, but uh, people, people sort of, you know, post about their, their site's annual science council meeting. There are brown bags that happen across the network that can make it on here. Um, sort of, you know, a, a catch all for all the events across the network. Um, and we're hoping it ends up in a in, in an active and vibrant discussion across you know so all sorts of topics from information management um, between the the IMs at sites and people that have data needs to, to you know conversations about science to to you know conversations about what could make the next synthesis project here at the LTER stuff like that. Um, but to really make this great, right, we need a lot of uptake, right? We need you guys to get on there and sort of start to use it and 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 uh, and really check check this thing out and make it make it a part of your LTER experience. So highly encourage um, going to the LTER Net Community Forum. Um, the link is uh, in this document and uh, and signing up and just and just staying staying up to date with what's going on in the network. Um, I will add on top of that, Gabe, that one of the advantages of the community forum is that you can choose the topics and the keywords that you want to follow. So that whole fire hose of information could get a little overwhelming for folks. Um, pick a couple of keywords that uh, you're interested in, and those announcements related to those keywords will come directly to your email box. Back to Gabe. Yeah, and then so we also have LTER meetings, uh, you know, sort of in person, uh, in person meetings where people get together and talk about the network. Um, so we have site all hands meetings. Every site has an annual meeting, um, which are usually two day, three day events um, where all the researchers at the sites get together and talk about the science at the site. Um, so I was just recently at the Morea Coral Reef uh, All Scientists Meeting, and man, it was a great, great way to sort of get an overview of all the wide, you know, wide and varied stuff that was going on at that site. Um, there's often poster presentations at these, and 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 they're 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 they're, they're pretty small, right? It's a really nice way to sort of tap in and get and get to know a small subset of the of the LTER population. So um you know these these meetings will will make it to our community forum a uh, great place to find out uh, where and when they're occurring many of them are virtual after covid um and so yeah pop in and give it a follow and then every 3 years we have an all scientists meeting our ASM um this is a you know 600 i think 650 was at our 22 uh 2022 all scientists meeting uh uh, participant meeting with students, scientists, educators, representatives, representatives from NSF, you know, outside presenters, really a way for the whole network to get together um, and, and, and talk about, you know, what goes on at the LTER, share experiences and science and, and, and updates. Um, a really exciting part of these is we have an undergraduate mentor program. So REU students from across the network um, actually get to come to this meeting. We fund their whole trip. Um, they get to come to this meeting with a mentor and sort of get to learn how to how to experience a, a scientific meeting and get the most out of a scientific meeting without having to be on their own, um, which is a really powerful way to sort of you know connect with a network and 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 learn how to you know talk to other researchers and get the most out of meetings like this. Um, they're really fun. Our next one's in 2025, so stay posted for that one. Thank you, Gabe. Um... We're a couple of minutes behind schedule, but we do have time for a few questions. Um, you can just raise your hand and unmute or drop it into the chat. Uh, and I'm also happy to stay on for a little bit. Um, reach out to all of us at the network office and at EDI by email or um, through any of those communication channels that Gabe mentioned. Any questions on any of that? Uh, Craig, how is the work of the LTR network different from what NEON does? Uh, so the LTR network is hypothesis-driven science. Uh, every six years, the, the sites 
build a new proposal, they update a conceptual model about how that site works. And then we synthesize across sites based on the mechanisms and the science and the understandings that come out of those sites. NEON collects the same, exactly the same data at every site. And the science is, they collect the data, they don't actually do the science with the data. The community picks the data up and does science. Um, I, and they're, they really are very complementary programs. Anyone else? All right, you're all gobsmacked, I guess. Um, <laughs> do reach out. Uh, we're excited to have you on board. Um, sign up for the newsletter on the network website, ltrnet.edu, and, uh, and jump into the community forum, and we're excited to have you.